Welcome to Real Vision. It's Tuesday, November 24, 2020. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington, joined shortly by Tony Greer. But first, with the day's stories, Haley Drasnan. One quick production note, because of scheduling issues, we're filming today at 2 p.m. instead of at 4 p.m. after market close. Hey, Ash. Markets saw record highs Tuesday. The Dow surpassed 30,000 for the first time ever. It's a milestone in the making. Boeing and Chevron were both up, which brought the Dow higher. The S&P 500 is seeing record price action. Energy, finance, and travel stocks are all leading the way here for a second day in a row. Oil futures also rallied for a second day, hitting their highest level since March, lifting big energy stocks like Occidental Petroleum and Marathon Oil. NASDAQ advanced higher too, but tech stocks lagged behind. These stay-at-home stocks won't benefit as much from the potential reopening of the economy, which is why we saw NASDAQ underperform a bit. We did see, however, Tesla, which is set to be added to the S&P 500 next month, surge to a new high and is now worth more than $500 billion. And fun fact, Tesla CEO Elon Musk is now worth as much as Bill Gates. We also saw the small cap Russell 2000 hit an all-time high. So what's the catalyst? On top of yesterday's news about promising coronavirus vaccine developments, we're also getting some political clarity today. A formal transition from President Trump to President-elect Biden is finally underway. Also, former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen potentially being Biden's nominee for Treasury Secretary. Her appointment could be a reason to count on more economic stimulus, which makes investors hopeful. I've also been keeping my eye on cannabis stocks of this month. Aurora, Tilray, Canopy Growth, and Kronos all soared again on Tuesday. They extended their stellar run this month as investors bet that a Biden administration could seek to decriminalize marijuana at a federal level. Several more states have also legalized recreational cannabis. Meanwhile, Bitcoin is surging, moving closer to an all-time high, surpassing 19,000 for the first time since 2017. It's been fun to ride this, that's for sure. But despite all of this green we are seeing in front of us at this time, Goldman Sachs cut its GDP outlook for Q4 and Q1 of 2021. The bank now expects a 3.5% annualized GDP growth in the fourth quarter, down from 4.5%. And the growth rate in the first quarter of 2021 is expected to be just 1% compared with 3.5% previously. The worry, of course, is the continued surge in coronavirus cases, especially going into the holiday season. With Thanksgiving this week and Christmas around the corner, we're seeing busy airports, so clearly travelers are, you know, ignoring CDC recommendations to limit mixing and mingling with extended family and friends. So we could see cases continue to rise from this already high level of cases we're seeing right now. And then that could lead to, you know, more or curfews and even lockdowns, which, you know, of course, we don't want to see. But Goldman does expect a rebound to ramp up in the second half of the year. The bank's Q2 and Q3 growth forecasts for 2021 are 9.5% and 7% up from 7% and 6% respectively. So everyone is fixated on 2021 as a rebound year. Let's see if this momentum continues. Back to you, Ash. Thanks, Haley. Welcome, Tony. You know, Tony, before we get started here, I just want to apologize for having you on on such a slow news day when there's clearly nothing to talk about in markets. Yeah, right. When is there never nothing? When is there nothing to talk about, Ash? Come on. Definitely not today. So, uh, Tony, tell us, what are you looking at? Uh, You know, this is an interesting short week, Ash, because there's a lot going on. You know, exactly as we said, we've got Trump look like uh, he's not conceding, but he sent that GSA uh, letter to um, approve the transition process. Yeah. For people who don't know, this is the Government Services Administration. This is the official administration or the official uh, organization in the U.S. federal government that controls the flow of funds for transitions, manages things like office space, which sounds incredibly dumb. 
Citadel, but is really incredibly integral to the process of transitioning to a new leader. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, to me, that sounds like he's finally, you know, giving ground and the market is kind of, you know, not been held back on that, but been looking for that confirmation, right, to, to really see it in ink. And I think that that's the beginning of it, whether his legal proceedings go further from here, who knows, but we're not really here to talk about that. I don't think it matters much. I think it's very relevant that, um, you know, Biden appoint Jan Yellen as the Treasury Secretary. Yeah. You know, what do you think about that, Tony? What are your insights there? You know, it's more of a familiar face. You know, I feel like banks are rallying in reflection of that. They recognize Janet Yellen. She's a sort of, you know, slow moving, steady hand. Yeah. She, um, you know, has a desire to create inflation. She's managed to keep things in check, although she's had some flip flop statements that I did not appreciate by her, where while she was in office, she said that she saw no risk of a financial meltdown or a crisis at all. And then as soon as Donald Trump became president, she floated a statement right after that that said that there was a, certainly a risk of, you know, it's, and she was out of office, certainly a risk of, um, you know, an economic downfall. And so I don't like that type of two-facedness, but we'll look at her as a, probably an uptick for our purposes. You know, right. it's a familiar face in the money management side of the sure. Fed. So, you know, I don't think there's any um, friction coming from that decision from the markets at all. Yeah, I mean, right. a couple of other points on Yellen, what I, which I think are interesting. Uh, she wants more uh, support for spending for unemployment and small businesses. Obviously, these are uh, are things that have a great economic impact and have a positive economic impact. Uh, and she apparently also favors additional credit support, uh, which uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, just set to expire at the end of this year against the recommended Fed extension. So prior Secretary of Treasury shutting down the extension for additional credit supports set to expire December 31st. Uh, apparently, uh, Chair Yellen still favors that. You know, the other thing that I think is really interesting uh, is, uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that uh, that uh, that Secretary uh, Yellen will be the first woman to be the uh, chair, chair of, the, of Treasury, uh, Secretary of Treasury. Hard to believe in 2020 that that's the case. But the other thing that I think is really interesting in a story that's been focused on less is she, I don't know if she is the very first, but she's certainly the first within modern memory uh, to have served as first Fed chair and then Secretary of Treasury. I'm not sure going back uh, farther, but I went back to you know James Baker and Don Regan uh, and uh, and Arthur Burns at Fed. I don't think anyone has held both roles in recent memory. So it's an interesting sort of pick because the ability to coordinate fiscal policy on the one side of Secretary of Treasury and with work with the Fed, work with Jay Powell, who clearly uh, you know they have this great deal in common. They both know what it's like to be in that chair, uh, so to speak. It's really an interesting thing for markets, and I would think that would have to be somewhat reassuring, at least in the short term. You may not agree with the long-term implications of accommodative monetary policy, but for markets, implication seems to be pretty positive. I have no disagreements on any of that, Ash. You know, just, just having somebody move from the Fed to the Treasury, it's kind of more of the rotating chair in D.C. that looks like we're going to get out of Biden, you know, with his cabinet. He just appointed John Kerry as a newly elected energy czar, I believe, right. is the name of the title. And so, climate, you know, right? It's climate. I think it's like it's somewhat basically global warming kind of stuff. Okay. Something brilliant and, and earth shattering sounding. Um, but we'll see, you know, what what that office's job is going to entail and what they're going to do. And but I think it's, um, you know, indicative that like most important for the markets, it's, you know, D.C. reunited. You know, and so that's good. That's got all of its corollary trades that are happening on the screen before us. And so we're just trying to keep up here, you know, getting the band back together again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's. um Basically, the big rotation in the markets now is, you know, looking past all the politics, I think, which is good to hear. You know, we're getting a bank rally that may speak to Janet Yellen being appointed. Yeah. You know, we're getting the aerospace and defense rally, which may speak to, you know, like we said, the, a reunited D.C. swamp. And that note that we, you know, have had no new wars in four years. Maybe that changes, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, with this new rotation that's clearly happening on the tape, it's it's a clear sign to me that the markets can continue onward, right. even when tech struggles. And so that's the sort of, right. you know, came out yesterday, the third miracle cure Monday in a row since, you know, electing Joe Biden president. 
we had the first one from Moderna, then we had one from Pfizer. Now we've got a third cure from AstraZeneca when only three weeks plus one day ago, they were telling us that we were months from having this vaccine. Right. Now we've got several of them on the tape. The market is looking way past the current COVID restrictions. And so now the rotation is FANG is going nowhere. FANG is stuck in the mud. What's rallying? We have to step out of the equity market and look at Bitcoin first. Yeah. Because that's you know clearly taking up all the attention in the room right now. Yeah. It, um, clearly, in my opinion, taking investors out of the gold market and and yeah. them into the Bitcoin market. I For those that, who aren't following, it's uh, Bitcoin over nineteen thousand right now, and Ethereum up over six hundred. These are uh, these are post twenty seventeen highs uh, on on both of those uh, protocols. Yeah. So that's the um, that that's the main. Focus trade now with you know with Bitcoin being up as big on the year as it is. I guess it's up uh, you know 170 percent on the year. Given what's gone on this year, that's pretty extraordinary. And probably yeah. you know why the best performing asset is gaining all this attention right now. So we've got that rallying, and now we've got an energy sector rally, which is something that we haven't heard hide nor hair from in, in years now. I would say, and it's just budding in my opinion. But yeah. when you, see, you know, a couple of consecutive days like we've seen now of oil services and EMP breaking out through very relevant resistance levels, clearly they're forcing all the short covering and possibly new buys in those sectors. But I think it's most important, you know, looking at the path, as we've discussed, of the fossil fuels heading into what the polls were predicting to be a Biden presidency. And so, you know, all that selling, as we know, as seems to have gotten done, all the ESG selling, all the Biden admin selling had to get out of fossil fuels before Election Day. And it looks like that's what they did. So we're in a period where they're retracing higher now. They're all looking, breaking out in various technical magnitudes. And you kind of have to decide where you want to have your chips in that trade. If you want to go with big EMP or if you want to go with smaller oil services or you know, you're going to have to, a chance to pick your poison there, but it looks like something that's just getting started with oil rallying above to, uh, above $44 now and iron ore, you know, testing $900, $1,000, and we've got copper above 7 k pretty handily. You know, these commodity rallies are all taking place now as we're focusing more on the reopening and also the assistance that's going to come from either the Fed or the Treasury. So now we're piling on, you know, recovery optics with better economic data and the end of the potential, you know, lockdown as far as the market is saying. So we're having all this take place. And yet the S&P, you know, as I look over my shoulder again, is carving a new all time high. And, you know, that's the direction that we've been anticipating it to go. And now we'll see if it continues now, if big tech is really going to continue to rally or sell off with the lockdown being its best case scenario now in the rear view mirror. Yeah, 3631 on the S&P 500 here uh, at about 2.20 p.m. But maybe we've buried the lead here, Tony. The big news of the day uh, among retail investors, at least, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average over 30,000. Yeah, the milestones are fun. You know, the milestones are fun. You get to, uh, you know, break the new hats out and get excited about new highs. But for me, it's it's it's. You know, it, it's good to be positioned having looking for being bullish and looking for new highs and, you know, being long some securities now that are trading into new high territory, which is the most fun part about trading, actually, where you have to make that decision and say, you know, we've never been here before. What do I do with this thing? Yeah, you know, we have a really positive view on home builders. They just carved a new closing high yesterday, and I think they're kind of flat on the day today. But that rally appears to have reignited itself on this side of the new rotation. So that's positive. And then we've got all the entertainment stocks that were just held down. Um, entertainment, I mean, like, you know, your live nations, Madison Square Gardens that were held down with the lockdown, cruise ships, um, casinos, hotels. You know, the world is getting back in business now as Biden appoints his cabinet. And the optics of that are just really powerful. And I think that that's why you're seeing some exuberance in stocks. Right. It's a relief rally. You know, Haley pointed out earlier uh, in the intro that obviously energy, uh, finance, and also the travel stocks that you just mentioned, oil also rallying on the day. Yeah. Yeah. The, the picture in oil, as I've been saying, Ash, 
through all three dips that we just saw into the mid thirties, um, I never caved in and became bearish because, you know, the demand side had been weakened dramatically, but it started to show signs of picking up the, um, physical side of the oil market. looks like we could be heading toward at least a good balance, if not more sort of structural shortages. And I don't mean anything dire, but things that keep spreads leaning towards backwardation and keep, you know, keep the bears honest because they don't get a chance to employ that floating storage trade anymore. Right. So, um, you know, this is the kind of season where you can see oil start to potentially run on the upside. It's a clear technical breakout. There's very little standing in the way. And like I said, we've got these positive optics for commodities right now as the baton gets passed from big tech to more, you know, industrial based materials based type of rallies. So I think that this is going to be the fourth quarter that we're looking at right now, this rotation where, you know, the, the larger cap technology stocks finally struggle to, to, to trade lower, maybe individually or collectively. I don't know. But I'm more excited about the natural resource space, Ash, right? That's what we've been talking about for three weeks. Uh, excuse me, the last three appearances, which cover six weeks now. And, you know, we've stuck to our knitting being in the natural resource space staying bullish um you know through lower prices in both gold and oil and copper and here we are so i think the most important note right now is gold is pulled all the way back to its 200 day moving average as bitcoin sucks all the oxygen out of the room and we'll right. see gold is going to survive as an inflation hedge and it, my sense is is that bitcoin as bitcoin approaches the old highs and gold approaches technical support I lean toward wanting to be long gold. And if I were long Bitcoin, which I'm not, maybe making a sale up against the old highs to see what happens. So I think that gold is going to get back on the screen as an inflation hedge. Right now, there's really just no reason for anyone to step in and buy it unless you're a technician looking at this 1800 level. So that said, if tech is going to struggle, we have to expect gold to struggle because the first half of the year was gold chasing technology up the performance pole. And now that technology is going nowhere, gold is trading in line as a risk asset and people are just ditching it for cryptocurrency, in my opinion. And I think that speaks to the Bitcoin and the Ethereum being up so big today and this week and, you know, kind of putting a cherry on top of the rally that we've seen for the last several months now. So many interesting points there, Tony. Uh, absolutely. This pair trade between gold and crypto, how that shakes out, how investors think about the inflation hedge, how investors think about a store of value trade, how investors think about the idea of wanting something that's a bit more off the grid uh, relative to traditional capital markets. Really interesting to see how that plays out. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, and, and um, you, you and I were talking and we, we came across this observation along the same lines that was it's amazing that Bitcoin took off as Apple peaked, right? We, we, we noted that right at the beginning of September when Apple split, we had Bitcoin take off from, I think, 15K or 13K and really start rallying. So to me, that was, you know, people looking for the next leg of the technology investment. And maybe they bought enough big tech stocks and they're saying, we can no longer ignore this cryptocurrency that has not backed off since we got through the lockdowns. And um, that dynamic to me is pretty clear. So I'm watching to see what changes next. But I mean, when Apple peaked after the split in the beginning of April and started backing off, that's when we saw Bitcoin take off. So I'm kind of watching them together to see if there's any relationship that's going to establish itself. Because the, the, the thing for me is to learn what Bitcoin is going to be correlated against. Yeah. You know, as a trader that's looking for an entry, you know, this is one of those good positions to be in, right? We're out of the trade wishing we were in. I'm happy for all the hodlers, but there's a lot of time on the clock and we can trade this just as well as anybody else. We just need to read it right. So my idea is, you know, to keep an eye on the other sort of facets of the market that are driving it, Ash, if that's fair to say, to see what it's responding most to. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what I'm trying to figure out right now to see if we can learn something about that. But we, like we said, that we've been ahead of that curve and, and trying to get back into the trade now is just uh, going to be a study in uh, tactical trading, but we'll figure it out. Yeah, you know, that really is an intriguing point. If you listen to the hodlers, they talk about Bitcoin as a totally uncorrelated asset class. That's, you know, part of the mantra. 
um, that the idea is that this is uh, this is a this is the rise of a new asset class. It's the rise of a new way uh, of thinking about value. It's a rise of uh, new mechanisms for commerce, uh, investing, store of value functions, all of these different things. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, traders like you are looking at this to try to figure out where those correlations are. Uh, and you know, correlations uh, may you know may move in in different directions at different times. Uh, they may uh, they may correlate at different levels in different ways. Uh, and but there's always seems to be something that you can correlate uh, uh, these these things to in the short run, at very least, right? Yeah, you know, we always look to the bond market as our guide for everything, and and Bitcoin's not being driven by I don't think anything going on in the bond market, you know. Um, it, it seems to be responding to new stimulus stories out of the Federal right. Reserve. It seems to be, to me, responding to authoritarian encroachment here in the U.S. as lockdowns get more severe and California takes a turn for, you know, more lockdowns and more acts out of government news, uh, Gavin Newsom, you see Bitcoin go on another skipping run again. So I'm yeah. trying to out if that's part of the correlation and people are really interested in betting on this new system because of the insanity that they see right in front of their face or if it really is a very very um trackable and sort of well-paced rally for bitcoin that's just going to blow through the old high here and right. then go, you know that's what's so exciting about this frontier market ash is that Nobody knows where it's going, so the prognosticators will throw price targets on it. Like, I think it's going to 40K. The next guy thinks it's going to 100K because that seems like a new logical, psychological barrier. Sure. And then, you know, you hear the ultra Uber bulls calling for it to go to a million. You know, and that's not even something that we can conceive as traders because it doesn't seem like that's a realistic path. But, you know, who knows? Maybe through 20K, it's a double and uh, we have to figure it out from there. But I'm really just a, a price action and trying to figure out what it's what it's really trading off of at its core right now, which is very tough to do. Yeah, you know, talking about price action, there's so much. It's such a rich area to mine. Rao likes to call uh, cryptocurrencies Bayesian uh, distributions relative to their correlations. They trade off different things at different times, uh, kind of the way the macro trade works. But just looking at the tactical price action on Bitcoin, you know, it's really interesting. If you pull up the chart on your screen, you know, what you'll see is that we talk about crypto winters in the crypto space. You'll see that, it, that there, are, there are peaks and valleys here. Uh, and there really are three kind of proper peaks. The first one, most notoriously in 2017, uh, when Bitcoin either reached or nearly reached 20,000 for the first time. I say that with some uncertainty because at the time the intra exchange, inter exchange deltas were so high that you could be getting a price that was five or seven or 10% off uh, on one exchange, what you'd be getting on another. So big inter exchange deltas there. Uh, and then we saw in uh, in 2019, I believe Bitcoin crossed uh, after after enduring the the crypto winter between 2018 and early 2019, crossed 10,000 again. So now we're getting obviously close once again to that that very sort of critical key psychological 20,000 mark. We're at about 19,199 here at around uh, 2:30 p.m. Um, but what's really interesting, and this is a story that's getting lost, and it's not really getting covered in traditional financial press. So while we have not yet technically hit the all-time high, or ATH as the holders call it, uh, in the Bitcoin space, we are actually now at a new all-time high for market capitalization because of inflation. So meaning the rate that the, there are more Bitcoins circulating now because of the regular inflation schedule. So the total market capitalization for Bitcoin right now, as we're having this conversation at an all-time high, $356 billion network value or market cap, depending upon what you want to call it. That's an interesting stat. You know, it's very interesting also to hear, Ash, because this this move to the highs in Bitcoin is very different than the last one. You know, the last one seemed to have it was being led by a lot of inexperience and a lot of new voices that nobody had any idea what these voices were about or where they were from. Um, it had very much the tinge of that dot com bubble feel where you were getting texts all over the place about, well, look, do you see this thing now? Do you see this thing now? And, you know, this time around, though, it's much more orderly. It's got much more intellectual capital behind it. I'm sure that it's got, you know, a lot more people now even looking at it more seriously than the last time around at 20K. You know, it seems to, no matter what, be elbowing its way onto the institutional trading desk. Yeah. You know, 
when when it's getting color on on CNBC, et cetera, et cetera, and you're having all the you know all the big names come on and talk about it. Now you're you're spreading you know spreading the growth seeds for other funds to say, hey, should we be in this thing? We're not yet, and maybe it's time we bite the bullet and get a piece of it. And so I think that's the difference in the decision making that's being you know that's happening around Bitcoin price action right now, and why it's a lot different than that last flurry. Um, where I was seeing crazy things like, you know, sort of inexperienced traders buy a Rolex with Bitcoin on their Instagram story. And so like, <laughs> things like that at Bitcoin 20, it was easy to say, yeah. guys, I don't know much about this thing, but this looks toppy, right? Yeah. And, you know, now we're not seeing a lot of that, uh, of that bravado. And so it's more encouraging and we'll see how it shakes out. But it's just a fun story to follow for me right now. Yeah, absolutely. I'll throw in uh, a couple additional wrinkles here. So number one, obviously, we've seen some very big names, uh, Paul Tudor Jones, BlackRock, um, uh, Stan Druckenmiller coming out with uh, favorable comments and support of Bitcoin. So there is uh, the perception. Uh, so there's the actual fact that uh, institutional traders are pulling into the trade right now, and also the perception among retail investors that institutional <laughs> investors are piling into the trade and therefore driving additional demand. But perhaps the most interesting story of the day that I saw on this uh, is my buddy Lawrence Lewitton, who is the uh, managing editor of markets over at Coindesk, who's been covering this story, who's talking about supply constraints driving price higher. Uh, there's an exchange that most people who are outside the space have probably never heard of called OKEX uh, that has had some issues with supply, uh, and that potentially could be causing a supply crunch, which is uh, obviously, if you hold demand constant, pushing up uh, the uh, equilibrium price. So it's a really interesting story. If you're not reading Lawrence Lewitton uh, in this space, you really should be because he's one of the smartest uh, people out there who's looking at this, someone with a CFA who's got a you know a hedge fund trading background, taking a look at what's happening in the space. It's really, really interesting. There are just so many stories unfolding at once. It's hard to get our head around it. Yeah, it sure is. I, I won't get my head around it until there's a futures board and an entire futures curve and we get to learn something about the number of contracts there are and how big the market is there. And so I can quantify it a little bit better. Amongst yeah. But, you know, we're going to make our way around and try to educate ourselves just like everyone else, Ash. Yeah. And that, you know, you, to your point, right, you've got these, you've got the contracts on the CME, uh, you've got these offshore exchanges that are running effectively paramutual books. I mean, there's just so much complexity around this space. Uh, and I would, and I would also say buyer beware, uh, this is upside volatility potential for downside volatility as well. Yeah. I would not be shocked if Bitcoin traded 15 K tomorrow morning, you know, anything like that could happen. And so that's when you're going to get the opportunities and, um, We'll be around for those too, just like we yeah. did for the opportunities and the commodity opportunities. You know, it's always a long race. That's what we say. Yeah, you know, my my strong belief is that Bitcoin is going to be higher uh, in ten years. Where it's going to be tomorrow morning? I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if you you could see an event uh, where you had uh, Bitcoin under ten thousand in two thousand twenty one. Right? Nothing is uh, beyond possibility when there's this much volatility in an asset class. Totally. Yeah. All right, Tony, we've gone down the crypto rabbit hole, which is easy to do these days. Uh, what else are you thinking about uh, in terms of traditional capital market assets? You know, I think the next leg is going to come from the dollar index breaking down through 92. To me, that's sort of the low hanging fruit. Maybe maybe, um, maybe that bounce that we saw this week was the last of a, you know, of a short dollar cover and rally, because it seems to me like if yields are going to stay firm. You know, we try to break out and then yields backed off again with the curve when we started talking lockdowns. But now that we're looking at this reopening story, it looks to me like yields want to creep a little bit higher. It looks like the curve wants to creep a little bit higher. And I think that that's going to put pressure on the dollar, right? If we have, if we create this inflationary scenario here, you can conceive a world where the dollar index goes lower um, you know, and I'm mostly focused on the commodity currencies about, you know, I'm focused on the euro appreciating and I'm focused on the Aussie dollar appreciating. But if the dollar breaks through 92, that's a longstanding bottom that we've had. It might change some portfolios. Mm -hmm. It might cause a lot of people to either get out of positions or add to positions. So I think that's the next leg of the trade that I'm looking for. If we are going to continue to get this kind of support from Jerome Powell and we're going to have, you know, we're going to get some news out of the ECB in December. 
to see what that is all about and if that puts the dollar back in favor for a short period of time. If Lagarde comes with, you know, a Draghi type of howitzer and all of a sudden the euro sells off, that could lend a bit to the dollar. But I'm still thinking that technically speaking, the dollar down through 92 enhances all of my natural resource trades with that Aussie dollar and euro rally. So that's what I'm looking for, because then you'll get, you know, copper and the base metals to start rallying again. You'll get industrial metals and mining to start rallying again. You'll get, um, you know, some of the other industrial sectors like aerospace and defense and airlines that are looking past lockdown to start rallying again. So. I guess, you know, you always want to get the heart of that trade from the macro markets and be positioned properly in the equity markets. And there's one other opportunity, I think, Ash, that's, you know, separate from the dollar breaking down and the commodity trade starting to really perform is this cannabis trade. The cannabis trade is still crawling out of a hole, you know, a valuation hole, really, that it got buried in from the Canadian companies over the last several years. And now we've got a U.S. MSO story that is as attractive as anything I've heard in equities recently. You know, like we said, everybody's been complaining the value trade is dead. And here you've got, um, you know, cannabis stocks trading at eight and 10 and 15 times earnings. You right. know, so there are some real plays there. We're in a timing scenario where the big four MSOs just reported last week or the week before as they were trading on their highs. Most of them have backed off a little bit and they're already going back into rally mode. So that's really attracting me. The fact that the dips post earnings have been short in time and steep in price and they've been able to get onto their rally mode again. So that's a sector that's attractive to me for the same reason that energy is, is because between now and the end of the year, you've got a chance at 20 and 40 and 60% where I don't think you have the chance to make those kind of returns if you're betting on FANG stocks or any of the right. other subsectors of technology right. from price, quite honestly. So I'm kind of, you know, once again, I'm hunting that big return game in energy and in cannabis names. Right. Those are the low hanging fruit to me right now that are actually getting on their horse and starting to rally. Yeah, and for those of you who aren't following the cannabis space as closely as Tony is, MSOs, of course, are the multi-state operators. These are the largest cannabis companies that are able to operate across multiple states in the United States where they have either recreational or medicinal marijuana legalized. Yeah, exactly, Ash. And some of them are totally vertically integrated, um, you know, for everything from leaf to the brand to all different kinds of brands and products. But I think the most thing, most important thing is that We've got a lot of election uncertainty behind us now. We just had five states legalize it in the election. Yeah. You know, or the MSOs look like they're starting to perk up technically. Um, you know, when I'm talking about True Leaf, which is making a new high today, Green Thumb, Cura Leaf, and Cresco Labs. You know, those are the names that you want to get to know. Have those tickers up on your screens and start following the story. You know, they three of the four reported last week. Um, the earnings were most mostly beats, I would say, on the revenue side with fairly good news behind them. And the stocks just backed off their you know, recent highs and they've already some of them started going again. So, like I said, that's the um, that's the intrigue to me is that even after sell the fact news like we're seeing after their earnings, um, right. The stock right back to those levels they were consolidating at and looking good again. So, you know, like yeah. I said, this is just um, performance, big game hunting. And we'll see if it persists through now to the end of the year, you know? Yeah, always difficult to speculate about politics, especially in these two times, in these uh, challenging times, and also about public policy. But it certainly seems like, from a secular perspective, that the uh, you know the, the the genie is out of the bottle. This is something that is moving forward, uh, and the train has just left the station. Bipartisan issue. They're all yeah. going to need tax revenues. It makes all the sense in the world. It's going to happen. My 2020, my 2021 trade is I'm long real estate in Jersey City as all the hipsters move out of Brooklyn uh, to get near the city cannabis dispensaries in New Jersey. Dangerous trade. Dangerous trade. <laughs> Taking your ground in a blue state, in a blue city like that. But it could happen, Ash. It could happen. I'd love to see a recovery. I really would. Yeah. So, Tony, uh, information dense Real Vision Daily briefing today. Give us the big picture, what you're going to be looking at as you go forward uh, to see if the ideas, the thesis that you put forward today is working out. 
yeah, it's going to have to be focusing on, you know, I sound like a broken record, but the continuation of this change in rotation is the most important thing that jumps out at me. And when we come in like we came in yesterday for the third Miracle Cure Monday in a row, and we have stocks behaving exactly the same way, which is 180 degree opposite what has been going on from March up until this point. Right. I am dramatically drilling down into those sectors that have been performing sectors and securities that have been performing best since we came out on the first Miracle Monday with President elect Biden and the Pfizer vaccine on the tape, because to me, that's when everything was obviously very different. And yeah. if you look at that point on, you know, obviously Bitcoin is the big winner, but right behind it are a set of commodities. You know, you've got oil and iron ore and copper and gasoline right behind them. And you can, you know, now all of a sudden they're competing percentage wise against big tech, which nobody would have believed three months ago. So yeah. this, this change in rotation, the low hanging fruit of the dollar breaking to a new low level and the big game hunting of, you know, upside percentage gains that we might see between now and the end of the year in sectors like cannabis and um, energy and airlines and aerospace and defense. And all of it's lining up pretty nicely for us to, you know, be on a trajectory toward S&P 4K. And I just want to make sure I'm in the right places for it. Yeah. You know, we discussed it already, but it's something that you just can't overstate the importance of these vaccines, three independent vaccines, uh, you know, separate but related mechanisms of action, uh, increased uh, ability to distribute them no longer. Uh, some of the newer vaccines having to be in the deep freeze. Uh, equity markets obviously look forward, forecast cash flows into the future. This just seems in general uh, like a very positive sign, a positive thing for markets, a positive thing for the country, positive thing for the world. Totally does. Totally does. Markets are celebrating. They're celebrating with good reason. And, uh, you know, you want to be positioned for that, right? That's what you sit here for all day and all night. Yeah. Very well said. Tony Greer, thanks for joining us. Ash, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure.